This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, Friday, Trump week. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Tim Apicella. We're going to get right to it. We're going to call this show <clears throat> The Democrats Take the House. Ooh, exciting. Let's go right through it. Let's discuss what this all means. Good morning, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I knew it. you'd say that. Well, I have to. These things are just mandatory. Good to be here. Um, well, this is a big moment. I mean, for a lot of reasons. Number one, the composition of the House has changed forever. I mean, there were things that uh, new so members forever. that came in that, you know, had never been in the House. Of oh, yeah. Before. Sure. The diversity is, is really good, really incredible. And uh, when and Nancy Pelosi with all those kids around her, oh, it touched my heart. Yeah, no, it, it was, was an example of a, an accurate reflection of America today. Yeah. I mean, you and let's not forget that Nancy Pelosi is the second Speaker of the House. That's a historical fact. Um, it was a historical fact when she became the Speaker of the House the first time, but now it's been she's been reelected to the yeah, position. Yeah, she's good. I think she's well, the she, right person. You know, right I, I got to tell you, I, at first I, I I just said let's move on, let's start fresh, let's move on from the I hate to say it, the Clinton days, because um, I think Pelosi is associated with the Clinton days, and I said let's start fresh and let's you know have a campaign that will actually be competitive in the 2020 election. Um, but looking at how things are, she's the right person at she's the right the time. right time, right person. I yeah. agree, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, and, and she got them together, and she, well, everybody voted for her. It was really cool. Um, but where does it go from here? She, she got them together to vote for the, the non-wall funding. That was good. Um, whether it goes anywhere is another question. But can she hold on to that? Uh, how much of um, how much of a, a leader is she? Is she a Lyndon Johnson? You know, if you, by the way, you got to see that movie, LBJ, fabulous movie. Woody Harrell's is fabulous. Saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, you know, will, will this continue? Will she be able to marshal them? Now, you know, the big question. I say it to everybody in the elevator. Not a penny for the wall. I tell them, tell your friends, <laughs> write to Nancy. But I think Nancy already says that. Not a penny for the wall. And the question is, is she going to be able to maintain that? Well, her revised position was, I'll charge a dollar. <laughs> I'll give him a dollar. <laughs> so, I wouldn't um, give him a dollar myself. Well, she said she would. So one dollar, <laughs> U.S. tender, that's what she offered. Uh, you know, it's interesting that she has, in, and as promised, the, the House was going to take up that Senate bill and, and pass it. But something interesting happened. Mm. Uh, five Republicans voted for it. And these were Republicans that are in states that are purple states, if you will. And those, uh, they're up for, for election in 2020. So um, being pushed in this corner of $5.6 billion or bust um, isn't sitting well with them. And they have actually come out and said, hey, you know, we will, we will vote for this. We can worry about the 5.6 later, but we want this government opened up. Um, Senator Cory Gardner. Republican from Colorado. Now, Colorado, by the way, has a lot of federal employees. There are uh, 7,000 residents, or you know, are government employees, and they're pretty much out of work. And they're estimating that the park shutdown is costing them, you know, right now about 24 to 26 million dollars. Not billions, but millions. But for a state, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of re that's a lot of lost revenue. So I understand there are three there are three separate um, possibilities. One is uh, uh, they, they continue to work in the special agencies. They work and they get paid. Second is uh, they don't continue to work, but they'll get paid later. Uh, uh, they're, they're at home. And the third, I'm not sure this is, uh, you know, a, a large category, but um, they're on furlough. They don't get paid. They don't work. Nothing. Um, in any event, what's happening is a substantial part of the, of the federal government is not productive. And some of it is not productive, and we're paying for it, both. Um, so this is really destructive. And, and what he's doing is uh, extortion. He's holding everybody hostage uh, on his point, which he could not get Congress to agree with. It's the president trying to, you know, <laughs> overcome uh, the vote in Congress. Uh, this, is, this doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound like it's the will of the people. It doesn't sound constitutional. I think he's, push I think he's pushing us into a, a constitutional crisis. I think we're already there. I think there have been many constitutional crises in his administration, but we're definitely in one now. How long can you continue without an operating federal government? Something is going to happen. Well, just about an hour and a half before this show is taking place right now, here at 11 o'clock in the morning, he basically said, I'm prepared to shut down the government for years. Years. 
<laughs> so you, well, you go, you go uh, well, you know, if you think you can shut down this government for years, what does that say about our government? And, you know, why collect taxes? So, you know, if you don't need a government, why collect taxes? This is crazy talk. Um, but he, uh, he's he, threatening. It's just well, threatening. He's, he's polarizing the issue to a point where there's no wiggle room. And you've got, once you push everyone in a corner, um, it's whoever blinks first. So when you get in the elevator, okay, tell them all, not a penny for the wall. Yeah. By the way, I had lunch a couple of days ago, <laughs> and I told the waiter, you know, he had to do something about the wall. And if he really wanted a you know, substantial tip, he had to do something about the wall. And he came back to me with the, with the tab, and he gave me this. You can't read it. It's too small. But what it says, it's a check. And it says, pay to the order of blank. I'll, I'll fill your name if you like. Uh, Five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. Uh, memo, border wall. And uh, he named the bank. I won't mention it. Uh, I doubt that anybody around has that kind of money. I'm deposit. pretty sure there's not enough assets under that column of, sure. of, of assets for that particular <laughs> bank. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the interesting thing about this is it's not enough money. It's only $5 billion because sometime between my lunch on Tuesday, here on Friday, the $5 billion went up to $5.6 And I'll, pre I'll predict it's going to go higher. That's, that's Mr. Trump's you know, approach. You double down. Before you know it'll be 6 or $7 billion. And this is his way of trying to get to $5 billion. Well, he patted, you know, he patted the House of Representatives on the back saying, great job. Um, the, the House actually passed the 5.6 just before, you know, the, um, the new year. Mm -hmm. And so he was very pleased with that. Um, you know, I, I just can't help but get my arms around the semantics. We are, we're, you know, he's demanding $5.6 billion for a wall. And he says, well, you can call it whatever you want. I don't think the Democrats are, are opposed to border security. I just, you know, no, so we're getting, so many other we're getting lost, we're getting lost in semantics. And the result the is methodology. The, the methodology and semantics. But the end result is we have over 800,000 federal employees basically out of work. And maybe some of them will get paid back later. And maybe some of them won't. It's extortion. It's not the way you run a democracy. You have votes on things. And, and he and uh, Mc, Mc, McConnell are not allowing this to come to a vote in, this, in the Senate. McConnell's really strange approach on this. I am not going to put this on the floor for a vote until the president tells me that he will sign it if we approve it. Wait a minute. Where's the equal branch of government? What is that? He's <laughs> surrendering to the will of the president. Yeah. This, that's not the way the framers intended. He's, what he's doing is he's, he's vetoing before a veto. That's Good not point. the way the framers intended. It's a violation and creates... It's a very strange crisis. action. It's a very, very strange action. And, and if you're taking your first civics class uh, in high school, you're going, uh, teacher, is this the way it's supposed to happen? Yeah, so what's gonna, what will happen here? You know, and Nancy, n nice move on Nancy's part, because it, it shifts the blame to where it should be, to where S Trump himself said it would be on him for, for shutting down the government. And uh, he's trying to deflect it, but he said it was him. That's what he said in the meeting on December 11th, I think it was. So what happens now? Uh, I guess it's a question of whether the Republicans in the Senate break ranks. And the ones who broke ranks in the House are an interesting you know, phenomenon because they indicate that some Republicans are willing to break ranks, um, to you know, get out from under the Republican Party mantra these days, to get out from under Trump, and to improve their position Next time we run for next time they run for office, which I think it will. Yeah. Um, and now, so now the question is, what other Republicans will do that? Well, now we lost the critics of the Senate, of the president, uh, Jeff Flake from Utah, uh, Bob Corker from Tennessee. But remember, every time there's a vacuum, someone is always going to fill it in. Oh yeah. And I think Mitt Romney might have thrown his hat into that into yeah. that ring uh, to be a critic of the president. Yeah. Uh, he's very, very popular in Utah. They said they could, he could be senator for life, given the fact that he's, he's that well adored and, and, and revered, and he certainly gets the votes when he runs for election. Yeah. So what does Trump do? He criticizes him, calls him names, the way he did McCain, same thing. If you oppose Trump, he, he will call you names and belittle you and mock you and all that. Um, this is his M.O. And this is an M.O. we will see in the 2020 elections. We will see him do that no matter who is running against him. We're going to see this M.O. So um, before again. he became president, and it's his modus operandi. That's what he does. Yeah. It's his strategy. Um, he criticized Mattis the same way. Oh, horrible. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, poor General Mattis. Um, 
you know, he criticized him now in uh, his, his efforts in Afghanistan. He said, well, he was fired by Obama, and uh, what, did he do, what did he do for me? And then he basically called him a Democrat. Well, well what that really means is he's not loyal to Trump. And uh, if you're not loyal to Trump, you have to go. And he criticizes you when you do go, or when you criticize him. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I think it's just phenomenal that this guy is, is rising up as the sole dictator of policy in the country. It's, he's he's um, he pulled the wings out of Congress so far. Uh, he's pulled the wings out of a lot of his departments. He's pulled the wings out of his staff, even staff that he handpicked, who, weren't, who ultimately weren't so um, loyal as he wanted. And, and he is, he is minimi minimizing everything except his own will-o'-the-wisp in, in a surprise um, and inconsistent uh, decisions. And, and he's wrecking us internally and in the world today. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I think... Well, I, th I think that you raise a really good point, particularly about his staff, because, you know, these were critical thinkers. The, uh, the initial appointments of John Kelly and, and General Mattis. I mean, these were experienced critical thinkers and certainly were expertise in their field. Uh, they're now and being they were replaced. courageous enough to tell him their thoughts. Right. That's correct. And so now the people he's replacing them with, particularly on some of these agencies, they're ex-lobbyists. Uh, you know, ex-lobbyists for uh, the oil companies and ex-lobbyists for pharmaceutical companies. They're lobbyists. And by definition, a lobbyist is going to probably be a, a pretty much a yes person. And, and that's yet, the kind of loyalty he wants. He wants yeses. Don't give me any critical thoughts. Don't give me any critical suggestions. I know what is best. I've got a good brain. I, only I can I fix this. I know better this. than anyone else. I know better than anyone else. I know more than the generals. I mean... More than the judges. So More than the Democrats So you're, you're correct. You're seeing the replacement of people that were brought in that actually knew how to run portions of the government that they needed to run. And now they're being replaced by basically those that will be loyal and probably not going to raise a whole lot of um, questions about his, his motives or actions or words. So that's where he's going. I mean, the government is being transformed. I mean, you can say, oh, he's getting a lot of heat in the press and all that. But in de facto, the government is being transformed. He's doing what he wants to do. He's getting away with things, getting away with things on the border. You know, yesterday, day before, they were doing tear gas against the, the you know, the caravans. And uh, on some trumped up, I use the term advisedly, some trumped up statement that, oh, they were, they were pushing the fence down. They were climbing the fence. Come on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they were using plastic bullets or rubber bullets yeah. uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, this is war. And he's doing this, I think, as a distraction, right? Because whenever he gets in trouble on something, he picks another issue to distract us with. A scapegoat issue. You know, the caravans are a scapegoat. Immigrants are a scapegoat. And, uh, and there are people who agree with him. It is most remarkable. Uh, let's take one minute before our break, Tim, um, to talk about the fact that his base apparently is still there. He said the other day, <clears throat> yesterday, it's incredible that he said this. He says, more people are calling me, writing me, telling me now that they support me on the wall than ever before. I don't believe that. I don't know how anybody can believe well, that. Um, but the, the possibility... Again, remember, we have 330 million people. So how many calls do you need to get uh, for him to be convinced that four. 330, you know, at least... 300 million support his position. Yeah, four, maybe five. Yeah, right. I don't know how many. Yeah, some, it's one of his friends. So, I mean, I, don't, I just don't believe that there's any significant information there. Um, the question, though, is, um, you know, are, is the base still with him? Are the Republicans still with him? Um, isn't he decompensating in public now? Uh, it seems to me that he is. The, the press seems to be more on him, more people are on him for what he's doing and not doing, for all the mistakes and, and, and incredible things he's doing. Um, are they still with him? You think they're well? They, we talk, you think they're fragmenting on him? No, I don't. And I'll tell you, you said it last week. You said it the week before. When he doubled downs, he doubled downs. Now, when you threatened, I'm not going to, you know, open up the government until I get my 5.6 billion dollars, and I don't care if it takes years. Now, that's not a double down. That's a triple down. Now, if you're a federal employee, you're going. What did he just say? And how long is this going to affect me? Um, so. Again, I think the immigration is where he got his first stand, his national um, luster, if you will. It was on immigration and the fact that we're going to keep Mexicans out and we're going to keep Muslims out. And, and that stuff is raw meat. And not only do his followers like it, but there are other people in the Democratic Party that say, 
I support this. Well, I, I ran because they're a, worried about immigration. They're worried about jobs being taken. They're worried about crime and drugs. And so he hits those fine points like a, like a maestro. He really has honed in on this one issue. And why would he want to solve it? I mentioned that last week. Why would he want to solve it? Right. He wants it. He wants raw meat. He wants to churn. And meanwhile, I, I don't want to go into any detail on this because it's too long an article. There was a story in the Times uh, a few days ago about uh, some uh, El Salvadoran teenager in Huntington, New York, in the high school. And, and his family came and, uh, you know, they got, they got uh, um, sanctuary, what do you call it? Oh, right. uh, and they, they applied for it and they got it. And they were legitimate. Asylum. Right? Asylum. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but Trump, Trump engineered a bill through Congress to require a, what they call a, a resource officer, a policeman, in every high school, maybe all schools, I don't know. And these guys would sidle up to the kids, and then they would report their conversations back to Homeland Security. Not every state is willing to do that, but New York is. And so this poor kid, his name was Alex in the article. Um, Alex uh, uh, drew pictures of uh, uh, a logo with horns, happens to be that's the logo for the Huntington football team. Right. But the cop didn't know that. And the cop turned him into uh, Homeland Security, and they didn't know that. Next thing you know, he's arrested and deported. He appealed, failed. He appealed again, failed. And then he gave in, and they, and they sent him away back to El Salvador, where he lives working. This is a kid who wanted to have a life, who studied very hard, who was not a gang member at all. Um, but they treated him as a gang member and sent him back to El Salvador, where he's working in the fields at $3 a day um, and afraid to go out at night because mm -hmm. the gangs will get him. Uh, it's such a sad story, and there are lots of stories like that, and that's what's happening, and we don't see that. Right. We only, we we only we hear what Trump it. wants us to see. The, you know, the, 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 there's a big story about the press, how the press is not getting information about the, how these government departments are shutting, shutting them out, about how Trump is shutting them out. He doesn't have press conferences. He had that briefing, the 90-minute briefing a couple of days ago. Didn't take questions. Well, that was a stream of conscience D yeah. kind of thing. I, he was all over the board on that one. And I'm, and I'm saying just before the break here that, you know, I think, I think he's kind of losing it. He's doing things that are so outrageous now that either, A, if people accept it as the new normal, that's terrible. If they don't accept it as the new normal, he'll distract us with some other, he'll double down on it. Um, and what I was going to say is that I ran into this Trump person over the, over the weekend, and I said, um, you know, how do you, think, how do you think he's doing? And he said, he's doing great. Um, how do you think his base is doing? His base is great. And I said, why do you say that? He's very, uh, he's very disruptive. And he said, exactly. That's why they wanted to elect him, and that's what they love about him. They don't like Washington. They don't like the Beltway. They don't like Wall Street. They don't like the establishment. They want disruption, they, and this pleases wow. the base. This is what satisfies So the dismantlement them. of the democracy in the republic is part of that? That's it. That was his point. And I'd like to dwell on that yeah. for a moment in the context of our break. <laughs> That's Tim Apicella. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. This is Trump Week. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests, I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, Tim Apicella and me, we're back. We're doing Trump Week here on a given Friday. And uh, the, the title of our show is uh, The Democrats Take the House. 
but it's more than that because what's happening, you know, you can't live on headlines alone. It's like you can't live on bread alone. <laughs> you can't live on headlines alone. There's so much happening. And some of it we're not finding out about. And I think that's, a, that's something, you know, we always tell people, you got to be discerning. You got to use critical thinking. You got to read a number of news sources. Um, and that's the only way this democracy can survive um, by the connection of the individual and the press. But the press is being shut out. And a lot of things that are happening, we're not hearing about. And the government is it's discombobulating. It's, a, it's failing. It's failing to do its, its statutory duties. Um, it's, failing to, uh, it's failing to respect the morality of the country, the, the ethics of, of government and, and the people. Um, and, and we don't hear about all of those things. And I think somebody has to do it. The Times tries. I know in the, in the uh, Washington Post, they try to do this. But it's harder and harder because this administration is shutting them out. And what, now you were talking about things that happen and we don't realize it. What are some of those things? Right. Let me talk about, before I do that though, I think the press is doing an outstanding job of trying to um, raise all these issues. But again, it's the drinking out of the fire hose syndrome. And there's just so much. There's only so much airtime, but there's so much that the president says, does, um, or policy, doesn't say. Or doesn't say. And the bottom line is they're doing the best they can, but how can they get down to some of the other stories that we don't hear about? Right. For example, we know that the government's shut down. And we know that we have 800,000 you know, employees that are right now basically in a position where they're not paying their bills. So one of the stories is that the Office of Personnel Management, and they admitted doing this, and they said, well, it was an error. We shouldn't have done it. Um, but they admitted that they sent out some helpful recommendations to all these employees, these federal employees that have to pay their mortgage, have to pay their, their creditors, have to pay uh, their landlords. And so uh, in an effort to be helpful, the Office of Personnel Management said, here are some sample letters that you can send to them, and this will help you. Uh, we're trying to be a, 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 you know, some support to you. Well, not so much. Uh, one of the letters was that... Um, uh, this was pertaining to a sample letter to landlords, and it basically said, I will be in touch with you to keep you informed of my income status, and I would like to discuss with you the possibility of trading my services to perform maintenance. Example, painting, carpentry, work in exchange for partial rent payments. Now, this was their idea of how we can help you while the president has shut you out of a job, how to shut you out of a paycheck, you can use our sample letters and send it to your landlord and offer your exchange services for painting and carpentry. It's not thoughtful. It has, it, OPM it, did admit that, yes, that shouldn't have gone out to employees. And then to start, <laughs> to start the conversation, they said, we're going to send you these sample letters. Um, however, we're not attorneys. You should consult your personal attorney. Oh, spend some money. S just spend some money on an attorney for money I don't have to even I, pay my I can't creditors. pay my rent. Uh, you know, it's, it's stories like that. You just kind of shake your head going, is, is the president that obtuse? Now, he was asked a question about an hour and a half ago. Uh, one of the questions was, as long as they're being, you know, furloughed, what about the safety net? And the reporter asked, what about the safety net for the employees? And President Trump looked at her and said, the safety net? The safety net is the wall. The wall will keep them safe. What? That's, that happened about an hour and a half ago. When he was talking about, you know, this wall and how he's going to get the $5.6 billion and how it's imperative that he get the $5.6 because it's national security. And yeah, the employees are um, going to be laid off. And yes, it may be a hardship on them. And it could be years, uh, but they'll be safe because the wall will keep them safe. And so, you know, I mean, what do you say with your reporter in the crowd at that time? Or what do we say as an audience later on? Um, this is crazy. Purely ridiculous. This is, this is madness. That's kind of madness. his response to a legitimate question about how these employees are going to pay their landlords, their mortgages, their, you know, their other creditors. Uh, it gets more outrageous every day. And, and as you say, it's a firehouse of outrage. How do you deal? Which outrage do you handle first? You know, the first 20 stories in, in the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Guardian are all about Trump. Oh, God, I'd like to take a rest already. But 
He's doing more outrageous things all the time. Look at the stock market. We should take a moment about the yeah. stock market. Yeah. <clears throat> he blames, what, who does he blame for the stock market? It's, well, the Fed. The Fed. Um, or the Democrats. There's somebody else. It can't be him. Uh, it can't be his tariffs, which are wrecking the economy, actually, especially in the Midwest with the farmers, uh, you know, that he, he was trying to help. That's his base. I think his base is in great jeopardy because of that. Um, the, the economy is at risk of coming apart. If the stock market is coupled to the economy, as it was in 29, the economy will suffer because of the lack of public confidence. And then you get this very stark thing that happened yesterday, which is out of nowhere, because Apple's, um, Apple's sales in China had diminished, maybe because Trump said it was because the price was too high. The Apple phones are too expensive. It's their fault, not my fault. <clears throat> but it's, it's a lack of confidence in the Chinese. The Chinese economy is affected. You know, when the president of the United States coughs or once it sneezes, everybody, everybody responds to that. Then the Chinese economy is responding and, and the American economy is, whatever you want to say, it's, it's, it's tied up with the Chinese economy. So our economy is at great risk. And people say that in the next few months there'll be a, a significant recession and it will be because of him and his machinations. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is going to be awful. Um, and, you know, I mean, one part of me says, okay, um, then people will finally realize, his base will finally realize, um, you know, what he's doing to the country, what he's doing to the world. Um, but you know what? His base is not invested in the stock market. His base is, they don't care much about the economy. Um, well, they don't have really big 401k plans. I mean, right, right. You know, it's... So, I mean, you know, wait, there's more. I, I keep saying, Tim, he's coming for us. We're going to be affected by this. The new normal is going to have an effect on everyone. Um, so let's go to the last point, though. though we only have a few minutes left. And that is, uh, and that is Russia. Russia. We, sti we still haven't heard from Mueller. Everybody's hanging on tenterhooks. All the talk about uh, you know, impeachment has to be conditioned on what Mueller is going to say. Because right now, you know, uh, it's an incomplete. Um, you have to know more. You have to know what we think Mueller knows. Uh, and, and there's some scuttlebutt that, you know, it'll be in February or something like that. Uh, the real question is, what does Mueller know? What, what, what kind of activities has he found Trump guilty of uh, that could lead to impeachment? I mean, I believe he has things, um, but what? Well, did he, get, did he get information that the oversight committees of the House that, you know, basically um, prevented from getting some of these documents and records, has he gotten access to them? Did Mueller get access to the phone company to find out who was called for that Trump Tower meeting? Uh, because the Oversight Committee in the House certainly tried to get it. They couldn't. Yeah. So does Mueller, has, has Mueller seen his tax returns? And are there correlations to <coughs> his tax well, returns? Well, I don't think that, Mueller has his tax returns. I, well, okay. So I, the I question know, is, how can maybe. Mueller come out with his report when some of these critical issues need to be, or critical pieces of information need to be put in the piece of the puzzle? Um, do we now have to wait for the House of Representatives to start getting these documents well, through subpoena? I don't think we'll have to wait too long. I mean, they're certainly going to subpoena his, uh, his records, his tax returns. Uh, there, was a, there was an interesting piece uh, in, I guess, the morning paper about um, the fact that uh, his family, uh, Jared Kushner and, and, and the son, um, they're actively involved, uh, and really it's him, uh, in building hotels where in red states where he succeeded in the election. They're building Trump hotels. They're not successful, but they're building them. Um, and I, you know, it's just, it's remarkable um, what's going on and, and, and we need to know, we need to tie it together because he doesn't, he doesn't really make a line between government and, and his personal business. And I think Mueller is gonna get into that. Well, I, I think once this really comes out, <clears throat> you will, in fact, even uh, Speaker Pelosi said, look, it is premature to talk about impeachment. She said it's, 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 it's going to separate um, the she party. She said we have to wait for Mueller. We have to wait. And I, I've been saying that for the last few weeks. And until you really see some, some really substantial um, high crimes and misdemeanors, um, we shouldn't be talking about it. Really well, but shouldn't. The, but the press should be figuring out what they're finding. And the press should be reporting it to us. Because uh, I think there's a lot of information out there that has not really come to the surface. It may be in the press, but it may not be at the surface because it's being 
is subject to all the distractions. You know, the oxygen is being sucked out in, in what he wants to be the headlines. How many so, distractions will we see when the Mueller report does come out? That's what I want to know. Oh, have. yeah. Oh, how God, many... I'm, you know, how many multitude of distractions yeah. will be played out I worry in order it, to take uh, the attention off this report? The more heat, you know, the more the distraction. So if things really got tough, I think he would somehow stimulate some, some protests, uh, some violence, and then declare martial law. That's a great fear. Uh, and then all of a sudden the Mueller report would be on page three. Um, really a problem. But I wanted to say that uh, last night, Rachel Maddow, I tell you about this, uh, had an interesting segment. And she found that, um, that, that Trump doesn't know anything about foreign policy. He, doesn't, he can't spell their names. He doesn't know anything about protocol, how to deal with them. Um, but, but one thing is emerging, and that is that um, he, he knows little, little unimportant things or unknown things um, that reflect the Russian point of view, uh, propaganda things that... We haven't heard from any other source except, you know, we find in, the, in page 37 that the Russians like this. One of them was a, a, a rumor that um, Poland was going to attack Russia. That, that's propaganda. That's provocation. Sounds like TASS news agency back in the Soviet Union. Really? That's, that's where <laughs> it came kind of from. Stuff, yeah. It came from Putin. There was another one um, about uh, Montenegro. Montenegro. He said Montenegro has some very aggressive people. They're going to create a war. In Europe, what? World War III, I think he said. Uh, what are you talking about? That Montenegro, Montenegro is a little country yeah. with a very few people, and, and they're not aggressive. A long time ago, you, you thought he confused it with Sarajevo. <laughs> but I don't know. But the very interesting part about it was that Russia had been manipulating the government in Montenegro, including a, a, an attempted coup on the prime minister, uh, and had been um, siding in the politics, trying to manipulate the politics on a vote. Um, and Putin had been, you know, uh, taking a position on this. Why? I mean, what is he doing in Montenegro? Well, he wants to destabilize Europe. We know that. But Trump knows what happened in, in Montenegro, even though... So is the, he really reading the briefing reports from the CIA? Well, that's or, what, you know, that's or is he Rachel, just getting this from uh, the Inquirer? Where, where is he? Well, she, she used the word stovepipe, Rachel Maddow. Ah. And, and she said that, uh, you know, he was, he was in touch uh, with, uh, with Putin. Putin was educating him about these things and giving him the propaganda. And Trump believes the propaganda and then he repeats the propaganda. But if you connect the dots, and her researchers did do that, I gave you two examples there, mm -hmm. many more. Um, you know, what you get, what you have to conclude is that there are telephone calls going on that he's not revealing to us that are not in the press between him and Putin, where Putin is telling him about these things and he's believing it, even though. So he parrots it. He parrots it back, right? So I mean, what we what we have is a, I think it's very credible what she was saying. Uh, I think we have a proof that Trump and Putin are in an ongoing active conversation, mm -hmm. and Trump we've seen this. Trump believes it. He likes Putin. He accepts what Putin has to say, even if it's completely unbelievable. Okay, and this is probably known to Mueller, and the relationship of Trump and Putin is probably known to Mueller. He's got to be investigating this. Not to say that it's illegal for Trump to call Putin or Putin to call Trump. I mean, arguably that's, you know, yeah, foreign right. policy, even though he has no foreign policy. But what's interesting about it is it establishes a, a relationship that is sort of under the surface. And this relationship, um, you know, infers, implies that years ago, before the election, they had a relationship, too, about the hotel in right. Moscow and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is I think that Mueller is going to focus in on that kind of stuff and try to show that there were, there were serious violations of U U.S. law by Trump while he was running. Again, collusion may not be a high crime and misdemeanor, but conspiracy is. And we'll see how, what Mueller puts together in this package to say who helped try to hide these kind of relationships and certainly uh, financial transactions back and forth. So that will be interesting. Well, I'm so glad we do this show, Tim. It's really interesting to be able to compare notes with you. We, we may not have it all, but if we look at it, it certainly encourages me to look at it. Uh, then we can come to conclusions and even speculations that are worthy of discussion. Yeah. And I think this should be discussion. You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. You know, I think it's good They're to scared. talk about it. Yeah. Some of them are scared. Yeah. So not me. Not me.
Happy Thank New you, Year. Thank you, Tim. Aloha. Aloha.